Broke the internet again. Verizon didn't break. <sighs> you ain't gonna break me. Still works. Okay, they ready. Drop the new music. Beyonce certainly knows how to make a statement. Queen Bey teaming up with Verizon in the latest Super Bowl commercial to promote her new music. Millions tuned in last night to watch the big game where the Kansas City Chiefs became the first team to win back-to-back -back Super Bowl championships in nearly two decades. The Chiefs pulling off an astounding second-half comeback, beating the San Francisco 49ers with a final score of 25-22 to in overtime. But... Of course, when we weren't watching the high stakes game, we were able to kick back, relax with some entertainment advertisements. Brands that you know and love shelled out millions of dollars to have their commercials featured last night. But which ones were a hit? Let's bring in Jason Harris, Mechanism co-founder and CEO, and Marcus Collins, University of Michigan's Ross School of Business marketing professor to discuss. Gents, great to be able to take some air time and really break down what we just saw. What did we just watch? And, and Jason, I'll begin with you because you're here in studio with us and, and we were talking a little bit beforehand here yeah. just about the atmosphere that you had going on at your place where you're telling everybody, shut up, I need to watch this ad at home. Yeah, I have a you know, Super Bowl party every year. Yeah, Everyone's eating the guac and chips and uh, talking in between the, uh, the game and I have to be like, I, I gotta take notes. I what was the clear what... strategy then that emerged in, in these commercials from your, from uh, your I mean, I, th I think the, the Play, the playbook that is pretty developed now is uh, you get cele you keep it simple, you get a celebrity, you get humor, and then you have to get the brand in there so it doesn't become just a celebrity ad. You got to really sell yeah. and get the brand in there. But I thought what, what was interesting this year is it felt like a lot of ads were kind of celebrity vomit. They had like, mm. not a celebrity, they had like, let's cram five or six celebrities mm. into the ad. And I think that made the message harder to get through for the brands. That's an interesting point there because we've got that Uber Eats commercial playing, saw the same thing with the, the Dunkin' Donuts commercial. Marcus, what did you think was the recipe for a really successful outcome and really how companies can build on this once they have the buzz going? You know, I think it's actually becoming increasingly difficult. One, because our expectations of, of Super Bowl ads are kind of through the roof. It's almost like New Year's Eve. It's never going to actually live up to your expectation. That's the first. <laughs> the second is that today, we're in such a divisive time post Bud Light's debacle last summer that brands are much more cautious about what they say, what they do, especially on a stage like the Super Bowl. And therefore, they don't take very many risks. So while the ads were fine, they were good, they were, they were well served, they weren't superb. I think it's a lot of it had to do with that we have constrained the, the creative brief that they cannot play in a lot of spaces. It's a lot more confined and therefore you get what you get and you don't get upset like we tell our four-year-old. Sure, <laughs> and at the end of the day, it comes down to return on investment, right, Marcus? So we have, it, it remains to be seen who is gonna get that best return on investment, but at least kind of in fanfare and how people are talking about it the next day, you can get a little bit of an informal gauge there. Who, from your perspective though, did win the Super Bowl ad deluge of messaging that we saw? I mean, my take, I think uh, probably State Farm. Uh, State Farm's ad was well contextualized, good, you know, set up to a joke, good premise, but also a uh, good play with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. And it landed, to Jason's point, it landed the brand's point of view that we're here to serve. We're, we're, we're good neighbors. Now, you cannot sleep on Verizon while you may have whatever you have about the ad the fact that Beyonce was able to to coordinate a new song release two new songs and the teaser for the album that's coming in March this is going to be a country album from Beyonce Renaissance 2 like you got to give Verizon some props on that one for sure and it really does then as you as you said that raise the bar for what people are expecting from these Super Bowl ads are there any that you felt fell flat uh, yeah, I think when they, you know, the T-Mobile ad, when they try to cram, I don't know, it was Laura Dern, the guy from Suits, Bradley Cooper, mm -hmm. just random celebrities, almost like whatever celebrity they could get their hands on, they put into an ad. And I think the brand gets lost. And I think, uh, as Marcus said, you know, State Farm was Arnold Schwarzenegger and the joke was their tagline. So that really resonated and it stood out. The other one I, I really liked was 
Sarah V be with uh, Michael Sarah because thank you. It's a, you like that one? It was an unpopular favorite. decision, <laughs> apparently, for me to say that that one was one of my favorite ones to our newsroom. But hey, guys, uh, I won. Yeah. But I don't know if Marcus agrees. But for a brand that doesn't have a lot of, it's not a famous brand. Mm. Maybe you're not even sure how to pronounce it. I think it did the job because Michael Sarah Sarah V. It's very clear. Uh, you know, what the brand is, and you remember it, it's sticky. And one celebrity, one joke playing off the name, it landed. While it might not be the riskiest ad ever, of course, like Marcus said, it does the job, and it's worth the seven mil to pay for media because now this brand is well-known and you've heard of it. So I think it did the job. Indeed. So then in terms of what are the benefits then, um, I want to bring you back in here, Marcus, for some of these Super Bowl ads that ran before, before the big show, what do they get out of it that, say, the ones who just spent that average of $7 million for a 30-second ad spent for the act during the actual um, game? They get us. They get more media. We talk about it for longer. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just 30 seconds anymore. They got a couple of weeks exposure. They get more time. And then we talk about it after the fact. So what it does is it helps amortize that $7 million 30-second spot. And if they're lucky, maybe their spot actually runs twice during the Super Bowl because there's overtime, right? I don't know about you all, but I think I saw the Timu ad maybe five times. Like I was like, good grief. Yeah. And it didn't deserve to be on Super Bowl, but that's another story for another day. But the point is that we try to put things early in the upfront so that we can get more bang out of our buck, more media out of our buck, which is essentially what people are spending the money on the Super Bowl. Biggest media moment in the country, they just want media. So what's the setup now? And, and I'll put this to, to both of you. I mean, we're, we're staring down a calendar right now where you've got just finishing the Super Bowl. We've also got, of course, just weeks away, actually next week, NBA All-Star. Mm. We've also got March Madness relatively soon after that. So you've got multiple weeks and now months of straight ad blitzes that are going to be taking place. What is this set up for marketers? What does this mean for ad spends? And, and ultimately, how this is tracking through to a consumer? Because this is a demand generation environment where we've heard time and time again from retail CEOs that consumers are being more value conscious and value hacking as well. Uh, Marcus, I'll go to you and then I'll bring you in here, Jason. Yeah, I mean, this is the power of culture. We identify cultural moments where the brand can have a point of view on that particular contextual moment within uh, a, a certain frame such that the brand can say something meaningful, whether it's the Super Bowl, whether it's Oscars, whether it's Grammys just a week ago, or, or All-Star Weekend. These are all just opportunities for the brand to be more than just uh, just a toothbrush, more than just toothpaste, but actually have some, some significance in the cultural zeitgeist. And we use these moments as vehicles to communicate the brand and the way it sees the world so that we can connect with people in really sticky ways. And, and I think these are the moments, because it's live sports that we're talking about, yeah. where you're actually watching the ads, you know, you're not, you're not skipping the ads. It's not a streaming platform. You're watching the ads. That's more valuable. That's going to cost more money. And you're riding the wave of the pop culture zeitgeist of the moment. So those, those are just going to keep going up in, in cost. And speaking of the zeitgeist, obviously, you, you couldn't throw a stone without hitting AI even before, generative AI, even before this, this uh, the Super Bowl. But then to see Microsoft Copilot, something that still a lot of people are not really that familiar with, uh, with how it works. What do you think about AI being you know, the dominant theme here versus, say, what we saw with crypto a few years ago. Yeah, I, th I actually thought there was going to be a lot more AI in the Super Bowl. Hmm. You know, I think there was like one or two. Uh, but I thought Microsoft, you know, they have, a, they have a real good head start, and I thought they did a great job with it. What do you think, Marcus? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the difference between AI and crypto is that last year, crypto was trying to convince us that it's legitimate that, hey, this is worth talking about, is worth investing yourself into. With AI, we're already using it. Whether it's AI through chatbots, we find ourselves more engaged in a generative AI space. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is figure out how we implement it. But we are, it's in our world. There is no getting away from it. So it didn't require a ton of convincing. This wasn't about legitimation. This is really just about context. I think that is an important distinction that, uh, that you brought in. I appreciate you both for joining us. Jason Harris, Mechanism co-founder and CEO, and Marcus Collins, University of Michigan's Ross School of Business marketing professor. Thank you to you both. Thank you much.